This episode of Doc Talk is brought to you by First Bank. We're not just your neighborhood bank, we're your neighbors. Our local team lives up to the name, putting our customers and community first. To experience First Bank difference, stop by any of our 13 Knoxville area locations or visit firstbankonline.com. First Bank, member FDIC. Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Rob Page and welcome to Doc Talk. Doc Talk is a podcast that is produced by the Knoxville Academy of Medicine and features its physician members giving information to patients that is topical, uh, helpful, and in some cases essential in making their healthcare decisions. And with that in mind, I have with me today Dr. Andrew Singer. Mm -hmm. Dr. Singer is here with me today from Allergy Asthma Affiliates. Uh, and appropriately so, although I'm not sure when you're going to be watching this podcast, but at least right now it's appropriate. He's here to talk to us about seasonal allergies. So yeah. welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So uh, Knoxville, uh, seasonal allergies. Um, are we talking about a four season allergy here in Knoxville or are we talking mainly about spring allergies or is there just, I mean, so start us off with what sort of things it, that, that, that people are allergic to around it, here? It's probably fair to call it a three and two thirds okay. season <laughs> allergy issue. Seasonal allergies really specifically are talking about tree pollen, grass pollen, and weed pollen. Okay. Um, and those typically start late February and will progress and continue all the way through the first frost. So about in November typically. So, so we're talking about so mainly like springtime allergies when things start to bloom, mm -hmm. but there are other forms of allergies, which not necessarily seasonal per se, but there are other, there are other, are other allergies that we can have during other times of the year, which may actually right. be seasonal, but not that type of season. Right, right. right. Okay. So perennial allergens, we talk more about molds okay. uh, and those will fluctuate throughout the year and typically get worse in the fall. So, so in terms of seasonal allergies, um, what type of, let's say I'm a, let's say I'm a person and I've not necessarily been diagnosed with any allergies, but come this time of year, I start to notice that things change. What sort of what sort of symptoms do patients generally have when they start demonstrating this? So typically sniffling, sneezing, a lot of itching. Itching is paramount in allergies. So like itchy nose, itchy eyes, sometimes the roof of the mouth will itch after they've been outside. Uh, and then you start progressing to sneezing, nasal congestion. And if you're inclined to having asthma, you may have an asthma flare with wheezing and coughing. So, so basically upper respiratory type things, including itching mm -hmm. and things like that. So, um, so I, I, it's, it's interesting you mentioned this. My wife suffers from a lot of allergies and she, and she complains a lot of sinus issues. Are people who have uh, allergies or seasonal allergies, are they more susceptible to having sinus problems or? Yeah, they absolutely are because the normal openings of sinuses are only three or four millimeters. And then when you start closing it with congestion from allergies, then they're completely blocked off and then people get infections. Also, sometimes uh, younger kids, for example, a huge part of the allergic population, they'll catch a cold on top of their allergies, and next thing you know, they're in the emergency room with uh, sinus infections. Gotcha, gotcha. So, so, so not only just annoying, but also, mm -hmm. you know, potentially, you know, very, you know, not necessarily, uh, you know, life or death, but something that could seriously cause, you know, something that would give yeah. us, you know, basically put us out of commission for a right. while. Right. It's, it's a huge quality of life issue for patients yeah. who have allergies. So, but... Um, there are answers to this, are there mm -hmm. not? Sure. And so I'm a patient who's been, who, uh, who has these symptoms. Um, so first of all, what would be my first step? How, when, when I came into your office and said, Hey, you know, I think I'm allergic to, you know, uh, you know, what, whatever sort of pollen is out during this time of year, grass pollen, tree pollen, um, what sort of testing would you generally perform? And, uh, what sort of, you know, what sort of help would you give me at that point? Well, the first thing we do is get a good history. What kind yeah. of symptoms have you had? Because, if without the history, the allergy tests don't make much sense. So you want to have a good history. Are the symptoms right? Are they sinus symptoms, allergy sounding symptoms? And then we'll typically start with skin tests. Skin tests are very fast to do. You get answers in about 20 minutes. They're cost effective uh, and very accurate. So, so how do these skin tests work? Basically, we take a little bit of allergen on what amounts to a plastic toothpick and make a little scratch through the skin. And we wait to see if there's a small allergic reaction that develops. And, and generally you test more than one or is this, would this be multiple type allergens that you would test this with? Generally when people are having a spring allergy season symptoms, for example, we'll look at pretty much everything we can that would be involved in that season. 
Uh, and a lot of people have overlap and they may have some of those year round symptoms too with dust mites and cats and, and mold. So we'll typically look at a, a picture to encompass everything they might've had symptoms around. So basically not only just, uh, just the pollen or the seasonal stuff, but you might test us and say, well, you know, you may have just a low grade allergy all year round and it just, right. just particularly gets worse during that right. time of year. One thing we wouldn't look at, we wouldn't look at foods, for example, okay. and that's not relevant for environmental allergies. Right, and, and generally totally different symptoms for food allergies. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So. So, so I come into your office, uh, I've been tested, turns out that I'm uh, allergic to tree pollens, uh, grass pollens. Um, do you generally grade the kind of reaction the patients get? Are there like severe reactions or mild reactions? And do you treat the patients based on that? So you, you treat based on the symptoms, not necessarily what the skin test size is. Okay. And, and for example, I'll have patients who have huge skin test size to grass and they say, I, I may sneeze once during grass pollen season, that's not a big issue. But people have very small reactions to cats who say, I can't be within 30 feet of a circus tiger or I have symptoms. So, so that isn't what's important. What's important is what the symptoms are and do they correlate with when the allergy tests tell you they should show up. Interesting. So, so the test itself doesn't generally tell you what sort of reaction you, you, you have you know, in a general basis. I mean, it can tell you, you know, how your skin's reacting or you know, can show you a fairly dramatic reaction, but right. may not be that dramatic. May, not correlate, actually, may yeah. not correlate as well with the yeah. severity of symptoms. So, so you come in, you test me, it turns out that, that I'm allergic. You, you've done the testing for me. What sort of steps do you generally take uh, initially uh, to help me with my allergies? So the, the first thing we look at is figure out what you're allergic to and then see if it's something you can avoid. Okay. Uh, is it something like dust mites you can avoid? Is it something grass that you can't really avoid, but maybe you can reduce your exposure? So, um, so in terms of, so, so let's say that it's, you know, dust mites would be, you know, difficult to avoid because you're, that's in the, that's in the house all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have dust everywhere. Um, grass would be, we would be able to avoid somewhat because you know, maybe not going outside so much, but let's say it's an, an, it's an allergen that I'm allergic to. I've got a job that takes me outside. You know, I have to be, I have to be outside for those things. Mm -hmm. What sort of, what, what sort of steps do we take then? So there are uh, simple things after you've been outside for those sorts of jobs, cutting the grass, et cetera, playing softball or soccer, for example, take a shower when you come home, get the pollen off of your skin, off of your hair. Because otherwise, it's going to be on your pillows and your mattress. And you never really get a chance to get away from it. So that can help in a lot of patients. Uh, wearing a mask, which is popular now, but uh, <laughs> that can also help when you're cutting grass. It used to be, you know, something people were hesitant to do, but I think will be a little more receptive to it I now. But say, it can yeah. go a long way um, for that. Now, now, have you noticed any change in, in your practice about about patients talking about that just because they're wearing the mask now that they see a, an improvement in their symptoms? So a little bit for allergy and mostly for the sinus issues because the extra infections, the the cold viruses, those are what take you from minor allergies to all of a sudden a bad sinus infection needing help. So and that's so, reduced. And and and, and so uh, you know positive side effect of wearing the mask, uh, you know not only avoiding coronavirus mm -hmm. but also avoiding maybe sinus infections. Yeah. Yeah. So, so so you talk about avoiding it. You talk about so let's say that that's not doing it for me. Mm -hmm. um, what sort of steps then would you take then? So next step, you look at over-the-counter medicines. And we try, we're trying to get away from use of Benadryl uh, because it's it does work, but it causes drowsiness. 80-some mm -hmm. percent of people get drowsy uh, and it doesn't last that long. So we look at the new antihistamines and things like cetirizine, fexofenadine. These are over-the-counter antihistamines readily available that work pretty well. And what sort of, what are the names, if I'm looking through the store, what so, are the names for those? So Zyrtec or Claritin or Allegra. Or Allegra. Those, are, those are the mainstays over-the-counter for mild symptoms. So, um, so let's say, well, well, again, you, you know, let's say that you know, I'm a patient and I'm already taking, you know, a Benadryl maybe at mm -hmm. night to help me sleep or, and, you know, and also to help me with my allergies. And I'm taking uh, Zyrtec or Claritin during mm -hmm. the day and it just doesn't seem to be doing it for me. Right. Uh, what then? Are there are more yeah. options that would be available yeah. to me? Next step after that would be steroid nasal sprays. Okay. And we've got Flonase, Nasacor as a couple of examples. Those work very well. They treat a lot of the symptoms, the congestion, the stuffiness, but they don't work quickly. You have to give them some time to work. So you have to use it ahead of the allergy season as well. So they, they require some forethought and some uh, stick to if you will, to, to really get the most benefit. So this is not something I could just use when I'm, I have to use when I'm symptomatic. This is something I have to use yeah. basically just to, because you know, the steroids actually decrease the inflammation. And right. so, you know, but so if I take them, I'm already inflamed. And so essentially I'm just kind of playing catch up. So I need right. to kind of, you know, basically decrease my, you know, the degree of inflammation sort of all right. the time. Right. So I'm taking antihistamines, you know, I'm taking nasal steroids. And I know a lot about this because I'm thinking about all the medications that my wife is on. <laughs> so <laughs> and, right. and basically, so that didn't cut it either for her. Right. So where do we go then? So there are a couple in between options. Okay. Uh, there are nasal antihistamine sprays. They're prescription okay. based, but they're, it's basically like squirting Benadryl into your nose. Okay. So for the really itchy sneezy, 
And for the intermittent symptoms, they're good medicines. But once you get beyond that, then we're looking at allergy injections, some way to make your immune system fundamentally different and less allergic. Okay. So now how do these, how do these, uh, so you talk about it, intrinsically what you're doing in a situation like that is you're injecting the, you know, a, a uh, you know, the, the allergen that the patient is, or, you know, basically is allergic to. What what's the principle behind that? How does that work? It, it, when you say it that way, it does sound counterproductive. <laughs> that's, that's right. But that's right. What you're trying to do, if you think of allergy seasons, you get very seasonal, short, intense exposures to these pollen, and then they go away. What you're trying to do with allergy shots is lower uh, lower exposure, more continuous over a longer period of time to retrain the immune system. So so essentially, rather than just be have the one large exposure where I get the huge dose you know, of, of histamines in my system mm -hmm. and basically get the horrible reaction. By having a low dose in my system all the time, my body becomes accustomed to having right. that having that allergen in there. I, and so I don't get so much of a reaction. Right. I tell patients, it's like sending your immune system back to school. Your immune system is learning not to be allergic to it, but to be tolerant to it. And it's not fast acting, but it's a much more effective long-term treatment. Gotcha. And and, and so, so, how, um, so if I need to go on allergy shots or I choose to go on allergy shots because I don't necessarily want to be on medications all mm -hmm. the time. You know, I'm tired of taking nasal right. steroids. I'm tired of taking nasal antihistamines. Um, how long do you generally administer those shots? Is there a fixed period of time? Is there, you know, a general idea about how long patients should expect to go on this? And and and, uh, and what sort of, you know, and, and how would this work in terms of, you know, me coming to see you as a patient? Sure. So generally we start patients on a very low dose and to get them to therapeutic level, we have more frequent injections the first year. So typically patients are coming once or twice a week during that. Most patients by a year into therapy, we're spacing out to every two weeks, eventually every four weeks, typically aiming for five years total. Some people, three years is enough, but typically for the average patient, five years is plenty. Gotcha. So, so, there, is, so, so there is an end in sight to where I wouldn't necessarily have to right. take the medications and all that. Right. So, so, now, so if I'm a patient and, uh, you know, and I've either been referred or come to your office uh, and seen you, is this something I have to worry about? Some, you know, this special testing that I would worry about insurance paying for, or is this... No. Insurance actually looks at this favorably because allergy injections actually reduce allergic burden and allergic diseases. So the sinus infections get better, asthma gets better. So they usually cover it very well. Gotcha. Uh, and as do the skin testing because you want to get an accurate diagnosis because a lot of people, because of the availability of over-the-counter medicines, will treat their allergy symptoms for years thinking they're allergic, but we do testing and find out it's not allergy at all. It's something else. It can be an anatomic issue because of sciences, an immune deficiency, for example, something would be completely different treatment. Gotcha. So, so fairly simple testing, or uh, and, and even you know doing a clinical history, just evaluating the patient, you can actually find other things you know at a lower mm -hmm. cost than you would you know perhaps getting a CT scan or an MRI or right. you know very expensive uh, testing procedures. Right. So exactly. well, that's that's incredible. So, yeah. so well, um, well, you've told us sort of about you know some about what you do. Is there anything else you'd like to add about you know stuff that you that you do particularly for seasonal allergies or anything? Anything, anything in particular that, that you and your office do that's uh, that you know that that's you know that you would suggest or recommend for patients or um, you know I think the biggest thing we do is educate patients okay. and give them more control over it uh, and find out once you find out what you're allergic to you can realize maybe I don't need medicines all year gotcha uh, and we take care of a lot of children too because a large burden of allergies in younger kids and the earlier you can identify allergy the more you can intervene and prevent progression from just allergies to asthma, for example. Gotcha, and, and, and so and with an early intervention, you can actually prevent this actually getting worse over time and the patient eventually developing asthma because right. kids are probably more amenable to being you know, treated with, with shots as well right. and becoming right. desensitized as yeah. well. So, um, well, um, you've told us about what you do. Uh, tell us about your office and your practice. Um, where is Allergy Asthma Affiliates located? Is there more than one office? If I'm a patient, uh, where should I, if I'm in the Knoxville area or maybe outside the Knoxville area, where should I look for your office? So we've got several different locations. We're at uh, Main, uh, down by Children's Hospital. We have uh, Sevierville location, Maryville location, Powell. Farragut, uh, Cedar Bluff. So north, and, south, east, yeah. west. <laughs> and, and Morristown also. Our and Morristown, yeah. so even further yeah. east. So, so all around the area, we take care of all ages. Well, that's great. So, so if I'm a patient and I have to come in and I have to get allergy shots, this is not something I would have to worry about driving back and forth. You know, if I lived in, in Morristown or if I lived, you know, in West Knoxville, I would have to worry about driving all the way downtown or driving my kids downtown. Correct. We, so, we try to see you at the office closest to where you are geographically to make so, it as easy as we can. So that's excellent. And, and let's say that I'm a patient and I want to get more information about your office. I want to contact your office. Do you have a website that I could maybe look at and get some additional information? We've got a website, uh, allergyasthmaaffiliates.com. 
And our phone number is 865-525-2640. We're going to put that down at the bottom of the screen here. So Perfect. It's safe, so that so for the patients to be able to see that. So, um, well, Dr. Singer, thank you so much for joining me mm -hmm. here today and talking to us about seasonal allergy and giving hope to those, uh, you know, who, who basically suffer from this, mm -hmm. especially in this area, because it, it seems to be pretty bad around the Knoxville area. It is. We've got gro <clears throat> great growing conditions. This huge national forest near us supplies a lot of pollen. So it's so it's it's, 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 not, it's not something we can avoid. Right. I was going right. to say. So anyway, well, thank you again for joining sure. me here today. Thank so. you. Uh, and with that, that brings this episode of Doc Talk to a close. Uh, Doc Talk is a podcast that is produced by the Knoxville Academy of Medicine and features its member physicians giving information to patients that are, that are helpful in terms of making their health care decisions. I'm Dr. Rob Page, and thank you so much for joining me. This episode of Doc Talk is brought to you by First Bank. We're not just your neighborhood bank, we're your neighbors. Our local team lives up to the name, putting our customers and community first. To experience First Bank difference, stop by any of our 13 Knoxville area locations or visit firstbankonline.com. First Bank, member FDIC.